All right. This is uh, the eighth lecture for logic design for for uh, 9/11 Friday. It's, it's an ominous date. Um, all right. So we'll get kicked off here. What I'm what I hope to cover today. Uh, we're going to work on uh, unit four, and um, and then it, it, I'll save a little time at the end to uh, uh, to work a couple of problems, uh, and then uh, and then. <clears throat> Let's first just take a quick look at the syllabus. I'll shrink myself down a little bit. So here it is. We're in week three. Uh, we skipped Monday, of course. We did Wednesday, and now we're doing Friday. Um, and we should have finished unit four on Wednesday, so we're just a hair behind. But uh, we're going to start reviewing units one through four starting today. So we'll be caught up, I think, after today. Um, and um, OK. And then uh, homework three is due today at uh, 11.59, so make sure you get that done. And I, I will work a couple of those problems. Uh, hopefully, every single one of you now uh, has uh, uh, heard from uh, Zedong, and he's got a couple of uh, 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 recitation sections set up. Remember, the, uh, the section you're assigned to, besides the main lecture section, is a recitation. Because you're not doing that face to face, it's asynchronous online. Well, actually, it's going to be synchronous online. He's going to do it live. You'll do a live Zoom session. So go to either one. I encourage you to go to those. I think uh, he will help you. He cover he works the problems really well, and I think that'll help you. Um, okay. Um, so um, let's get started. And like I say, we'll hopefully have a little time left. So that's the. We'll close out the syllabus. Uh, and uh, we'll close out this. Uh, okay. And what I will do is um, bring up the PowerPoints. And I think it's here. Yeah, there we go. And bingo. All right. Let me put my smiling face back in the picture. Okay. Oh, I didn't mean to do that. Okay. So... Um, so one of the things we're going to cover is the English to Boolean here. And that doesn't take too long to cover, but it, it, there's really only one sort of important point. And that is that, that when, a, when a customer disc, you know, tells you what they want, there's always the potential to, for there to be several different digital interpretations of what they're asking for. And you need to do that and eradicate the ambiguity. Okay. You also need to be smart enough to translate it too, but uh, I think that's pretty straightforward. Um, and then we'll the other thing, which is really the most important thing, we're going to talk about how you translate a truth table uh, from uh, SOP to POS, or, or sorry, how you take a truth table and you implement it either in SOP or POS solution using the min or the max terms. So we're going to explain the min and max terms, and we're going to do this. Hopefully, this is going to be real straightforward. And then um, we'll, we'll mention briefly design by iteration, uh, and hopefully we'll have time to still uh, work uh, some problems. All right. Um, so this is what we're going to cover. Uh, yeah, and we're going to, the design by iteration we're going to do is a four bit adder. And I'll, well, what we're going to do, we're going to design a one bit adder first. And then we're going to daisy chain four of those together to get our four bit adder because it's going to be a lot easier than trying to do the four bit adder all at once. But sometimes you can't do that. So, anyway. All right. English to Boolean. So, here's a sentence. Uh, so, the alarm bell will ring if the alarm is switched, if the alarm switch is turned on and the door is not closed, or it's after 6 p.m. and the window is not closed. Break this into phrases and then assign a Boolean variable to each phrase. All right. So, so let's break it into phrases. Um, the uh, so here's the phrases. The arm the alarm will ring. This is the output Z, okay. And I'm using the letters that the book used. Uh, I don't know. Uh, the book could have picked better letters, but anyway, that's what it did. The alarm switch is on. We'll say that represents A, and the door is not closed. So because it's a not closed, we'll make it B prime. Or it's after 6 p.m., so we'll call that C. I guess we could have said 6 C prime, but anyway, we'll say C. And the window is not closed. We'll say that's D prime. So D would be the window. If D is equals 1, 
then that means the window's closed. If d prime equals 1, that means the window's not closed, which would be d equaling 0. All right. Um, yeah. Okay. So notice we also put in the operators. So we had an and and an or and an and. So if we want to write this out, what we're going to see is, um, is something like that. Okay. And uh, so that's Z equals A, the alarm switch is on, and B prime, the door is not closed, or, that's the plus, the wind, the, it's after 6 p.m., and the window's not closed, D prime. Now, so let me, if, you're the, if you're a really sharp engineer, you look at this, and, you, and you're thinking, well, so let's see, if, if A is 1 and B is 0, then this is going to be true. And that means the alarm switch is on and the door is open or not closed. So that means that that would be that would that means the alarm's ringing. Okay? So the, so every time if the alarm switch is on, every time the door is open, the alarm's going to ring. The other condition for when the alarm's going to ring is if it's after 6 p.m. and the window's open or not closed, if you will. Now think about this for a minute. What if it's what if it's what if you're working late? Say it's an office, I don't know, or maybe a store, whatever. You're working late. It's kind of hot in the store, and you want to open the window and kind of cool off. But it's after 6 p.m. No matter what you do with the alarm switch, C pr C D prime is going to be one, and that means Z is going to be alarming. So you need, so you should, you know, when you see the customer's requirements here, you should say, so uh, do you want, do you want it to be the case that if you're working late in the store and it's after 6 p.m. and you open up the window, that there's no way you can shut the alarm off? Are you okay with that? And if, they, if they're okay with that, fine. That's what you do. But if they're not okay with that, uh, they may be unhappy when you build this and you you forgot to point out to them that that the alarm switch doesn't that, that the alarm switch being on is not a, is not necessary for the alarm to be going off. Now you can rewrite this expression um, like that, and when you do that, now you've made the alarm switch crucial. The alarm switch must be on. For the alarm to ring, which actually kind of makes sense, right? So if you just take the sentence as spoken, you could easily come up with the wrong logic expression. And 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 that's kind of true. It's it's often true. There's often ambiguity in the way things are stated in English, and you you as the engineer have to realize that this solution, and this solution, are different circuits, and once they're implemented, that's what you get. That's what you get. It's not like a box of chocolates. You know what you're going to get. And, uh, and so you better make clear that that's what the customer wants. And then if after you've done it, they change their mind, that's fine. Then you can submit a change order bill and you can, you can charge them more money for fixing the problem because you documented that you explained this to them and they agreed with it. So, uh, yeah. All right. So that's that. All right, so let's keep moving. Um, so, yeah, we talked about the real implications of these two interpretations. Now, sometimes, it, some, some things are not as clear cut. And, and then here is your, here is your um, circuit. And they are definitely different circuits, okay? This is AB prime, CD. That's, that's the original circuit. Um, all right, let's look at another one. You will gain weight if you eat too much or you do not exercise enough and your metabolism uh, rate is too low. Okay. All right. So you will gain weight, F, that's the output, if you eat too much, A, don't exercise enough, M prime because that's not exercise. And 
metazolam rate is too low or or it's not rate so that's that's y prime all right so let's see what we do for uh, so there's a couple of interpretations here you gain weight if you eat too much or you don't exercise and your metabolic rate's too low that's one way to look at it so that and and i would submit uh having been a director of a weight loss clinic that this is true overeating is really the problem for all uh, all weight gain um, insufficient exercise is not really the causative problem here however you're making uh, your metabolic rate the prime culprit i will agree that there's some truth to that too uh, so i think both of these interpretations have uh, a lot of merit so it's uh, so this is one you'd really have to think about long and hard You might want to come up with some entirely different construct, maybe factor in some additional things. But it is true, metabolic rate's an issue. I will, but interestingly enough, metabolic rate is, is it's two things. One, it's genetics, and two, it's lean muscle mass. So if you put on more muscle, your metabolic rate will go up. All right. Um, and then here's another one. The loudspeaker will be damaged if the volume is set too high and the loud music is played or the stereo is too powerful. So the loudspeaker will be damaged is F. The volume set too high is A. Loud music is played is B. And the stereo is too powerful is C. So here are a couple different ways you can look at it. You can, you can look at it that the volume and loud music are, in, are together all it takes to cause the problem. Um, and then if the stereo is too powerful, then then you can blow the speaker regardless, I guess. Uh, here, so here you're making the uh, the volume setting the critical component, and then either loud music or too powerful stereo being the next culprit, kind of equivalent. Here, here you're 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 setting the power of the stereo equal to the volume and loud music being played. All right, um, so normally we have to really figure out uh, how to represent in switching algebra what's, what, what is being described in words. But the most important part of this is to see where confusion creeps into the English. But in the Boolean, there's no confusion. It's very deterministic. Uh, your expression absolutely defines what you're going to get. And so you really do need to... Uh, think that through. Okay. All right. Um, so let me move this up here just a little bit. Now we're now we're going to start with true tables, and we're going to talk about uh, we're going to talk about how you implement them, and uh, how, how you how you turn a true table into an SOP expression using the min terms. And we're also going to talk about uh, uh, in incompletely specified truth tables or don't care. All right. So, um, so we have two options, and, and one involves using the ones, and one involves using the zeros in the truth table. So here's a truth table. Now, I, I, this is what the book used. I, I'm, I, I would not have written it. You know. So where did we get the F? The F comes from God, right? We were given the F by our customer. So in this case, uh, the, the author of the book, uh, Roth, made up this truth table. And he just picked it the way it arbitrarily is here. But it looks like there was some organization with three zeros and then one, two, three, four, five ones. But they're in order like this. There's no particular reason why that would be the case. But it, it just happens to be the case now. So don't, don't think that these zeros and ones have to be contiguous in any particular order. They could be, you know, you could have zero, one, zero, one, zero, one, whatever. Uh, so it doesn't really matter. Here's our three input variables. So this is a standard truth table. Three input variables. With three input variables, we need two to the three are eight rows. And we have one output column, F, because we just have one function we're defining. You could have others, but we're just doing one here. Now, uh, this function has is, is supposed to be zero when A and B and C are all zero. It's supposed to be zero when a, B, a and B are zero and C is one. It's supposed to be zero when A is zero. 
Now, it can't say a whole lot more about uh, what happens after that, but, but those are the zeros. And then when A is 0, B is 1, and C is 1, F is supposed to be 1, and so forth. All the way down to where when A is 1, B is 1, C is 1, F is also supposed to be 1. Now, we have associated with every single row both a min term and a max term, and they are, they are the opposite of each other. The min term for the first row is A prime, B prime, C prime, and it together. The max term for the first row is A ord with B ord with C. And they actually are the direct inverse of each other. But do never think for a minute that the min term solution and the max term solution are inverses of each other because they are not. They are equal. But the terms for any particular row are the inverse because you will never have in the max term solution a row with a 1 and you will never have in the min term solution a row with a desired output for f of a 0. So the same min term max term would never appear in the solution because they, they couldn't. They would give opposite results and that would just ruin everything. So, uh, so you only have the zeros for the max terms, you only have the ones for the min terms. Now, we have written the min terms here, but the min terms are pretty easy to do. And uh, maybe what I'll do, maybe I'll just write, about, uh, write a bunch of min terms. So you see that for every row, we can clearly define what the min terms are. And it's, it's not a big secret. Okay. So... this uh, zeroed in here. I'm going to I'm going to switch this. Oh. Okay. There we go. And it's not too bad. And I think I'm going to you know, bring it down here just a little bit and maybe it'll be better. Or maybe I didn't do that good enough. Okay. So so let's do a truth table. We'll do the one that's that we had up there, okay? A, B, C, and F. And we'll, we'll list the rows in pairs just because it's easier to keep track of things. All right, and F was 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1. But let's go ahead, forgetting now for a minute what F is. Don't pay any attention to that. Well, I'm just going to write the min terms for every row. So the min term for the first row is A prime, B prime, C prime. Where A is a 0, we use the prime. Where B is a 0, we use the prime. Where C is a 0, we use the prime. Where C is a 1, we don't use the prime. So the next one would be A prime, B prime, C. The next one would be A prime, B, C prime. The next one would be A prime, B, C. And the next one would be A, B prime, C prime, A, B prime, C, and then A, B, C prime, and finally A, B, C. Now the max terms are just like this. It's just that they're the opposite. So uh, in their ors, so we would have A plus B plus C. We would have here A plus B plus C prime. A plus B prime plus C. Um, A plus B prime plus C prime. I'm, I'm going to leave off the parentheses, but uh, A prime plus B plus C, A prime plus B plus C prime, A prime, B prime plus C, and finally A prime plus B prime plus C prime. Okay, I think I get, did all those right. Yeah, all right. So these, of course, would normally have parentheses too. I'll just go ahead and try and put them here right now. Okay, now... Um, so every row has a min term, 
Every row has a min term, and every row has a max term. Okay, I think you can see all that. So that's true for every truth table. If you only have three variables, you just have eight rows, and you have three variables in each term. If you have four variables, you have 16 rows and four in each term, and so forth. Now, all we have to do to do the min term solution is take the and terms wherever f is 1 and or them together. So in this particular case, we would take the min term for this row, this row, this row, this row, and this row, and or them all together. So that would look like, uh, that would look like a prime, b, c prime, uh, no, a prime, b, c, plus uh, a, b prime, c prime, plus a, b prime, c, plus a, b, c prime, plus a, b, c. And that equals f. If we want the max terms, we just take the first, we take all the, all the max terms where the desired output for f is 0. That would be the first three rows. That would be a plus b plus c. times, and we're anding these together, a plus b plus c prime, times a plus b prime plus c. And that also equals f. And these two expressions are the exact equals of each other. In fact, if I gave you this and said give me the SOP, you'd probably come out with this, although it, there's potential simplifications here. Um, you can combine these two and get a plus uh, b and you can combine uh, these two and you're allowed to use this twice so that's legal uh, and get a plus c. So you can simplify these three terms to, uh, to these two terms using the expression uh, x plus y and x plus y prime equal x. All right, one of the simplification theorems. All right, so, uh, and you can simplify this one up here using the dual of that simplification theorem, which is just uh, xy plus xy prime equals x. Okay, so, so remember, there's, a, there's both a min term and a max term for every row. They are, the, they are the exact inverse of each other. So if you take the inverse of this, you would get a plus b plus c. If you take the inverse of this, you would get a prime, b prime, c prime. So, there, so these terms are not equal. They're the opposite of each other. But because we only take the zeros for the max terms, and we only take the ones for the min terms, the resulting solutions are exactly equivalent to each other. They both equal f and they are equal to each other and you could convert this into this and this into this with switching algebra. Okay, so back to uh, switch the camera back. Oops. There we go. Alright, so so then, we, from that truth table, which we just did, you get this, and then you can simplify it, and it simplifies to A plus B, C. Um, yeah, it does. And uh, then uh, if you um, do the max terms, which I think, we, uh, if we z use the zeros instead, uh, and there are terms, and we're going to have to and them together, so we take the three uh, max terms that have where f is 0. We don't take the max terms where f is 1. We and these together, or multiply them together. We get this, and we can simplify that to, um, well, what I showed, a plus b quantity times a plus c. Uh, but I'll show you. I'll do the next step. I didn't. I forgot that this was like that. Let me just do this really quickly. So, so we, we already did it to, to this, where we had a plus b times a plus c. Well, now we use the second distributive law 
x plus y times x plus z, and that just equals x plus y, z. So this is just a plus b, c. Okay. So, uh, so you can see that that's just fine. But can I do this? I wonder. No. All right. Okay. So anyway, so so you see that they both simplified to exactly the same thing, A plus B, C. This happens to be SOP format. If we left it in the POS format, it would have been A plus B quantity times A plus C, which is slightly uh, more costly than this because you have uh, a single variable here, and in the other one you had two input OR gates, one out, two input AND gate. Here you have only one input AND gate and a single output OR gate. So you have two gates instead of three. So this one is slightly slightly better. And that happens to be the SOP format. And that's sometimes it works out that way. Sometimes the two formats are exactly equivalent. Sometimes the POS is, is slightly better. Or sometimes it's dramatically better. It can be that way too. Um, okay. Now, what if... Uh, so here are the max terms, here are the min terms. The min terms always come up in SOP form, max terms are POS form. And we use notate, we have shorthand notation. And here's the shorthand notation. If we have F of ABC, we can use the sum sign and we can write out the little M's, which would, would, would be, if you look at the truth table, so that's M0, M1, M2. This is M3, 4, 5, 6, and 7. So that would be the solution, would be M three, four, five, six, and seven. And if you did the max terms, we use capital M's and we multiply them together. So that with the capital pi sign. So that would be M zero, M one, and M two. And so that looks like this. And those would be multiplied. So that's why we use the, the capital pi. And here we use the capital uh, Greek S or sum or sigma. All right, now what if uh, well, here's another example. Now we've mixed them up a little bit. Uh, so we would need the min term from this row, this row, this row, this row, and this row for the uh, mac for the min term solution. For some reason, on this problem, we still had three zeros and five ones. It, it, it don't put any meaning to that at all. It's just how it happens to be. Um, and so, uh, so, so we would write the so the min term expression then would be this min term a prime b prime c prime plus a prime b c prime plus a prime b c plus a b prime c prime plus a b c and the max term solution would be the quantity uh, a plus b plus c prime times the quantity uh, a prime plus b plus c prime quantity times uh, a prime plus b prime plus c quantity. And that would be that would be these three max terms. All right. Okay, so uh, we we have this general notation. I don't care if you know this. Uh, it's I don't think it's super important. But uh, uh, you have this these little a's where where some of the a's are going to be zero, where f is zero for the min terms and and the ones where f is one will be one. So that selects that selects the appropriate terms. For the max terms, it's just the opposite. The A's will be, uh, uh, yeah, right. The Well, the A's will be, it's the same. Um, yeah. Okay. And uh, here we, we, we uh, here we basically multiply out to get to the SOP and we factor to get the POS. We simplify with our three theorems, not counting the consensus theorem, where we can combine terms, eliminate terms, or eliminate a literal. And there's, then there's also the consensus term, where we can eliminate a term. Or sometimes add a term and then eliminate a term. This is an example here of that. So, and here are theorems. These are the, the, the SOP, the POS, the SOP views, but obviously we also have POS uh, equivalents. Except for, well, yeah, and the consensus term as well. All right, now we have one other consideration and this is called the incompletely specified function. What does that mean? And this is actually very important because this, this does help us and when you do your group project you'll see this. Um, the, uh, 
the we we have some x's here which of course are neither ones nor zeros what what does that mean what that means is that our customer has told us that they didn't specify a desired value for f for this row because the combination of a being 0 b being 0 and c being 1 should never occur in their system in their device in their machine it should never happen so since they're guaranteeing us it, it'll never happen they're saying they absolutely it doesn't matter what what might appear for x because it won't ever appear so we can choose it to be something that simplify that helps us simplify our hardware and that's really the advantage of it it helps us simplify our hardware because we can pick it uh, in a, the most convenient way. Now in switching algebra it's hard. We normally just have to go ahead and work it out. We have to write the min term uh, four times, uh, the, min, the min term expression four times. Once where we pick both x's to be zero, once where we pick this x to be one and that one to be zero, once where we pick this to be zero and that to be one, and once where we pick them both to be one. And we get four equations and we simplify them as best we can and then we see what the simplest one is and then we do the same thing for the max the max terms only there we include the max term if the uh, uh, if we make the max term a zero and if we make them both ones we don't include them and and we and we see what we get for our best solution with the max terms and then when it's all set and then we simplify all those and we see what what it gives us our best simplest solution and there may not be a unique one there may be there may be a couple of equivalent ones or there may or there may even be a uh, or, or there, maybe there, maybe there will be a, a clear-cut winner. Okay, so we call these incompletely specified, where we haven't specified a value for x, uh, for f for this row, and we haven't specified a value for f for this row, and and it's predicated on that row never occurring. If if that row does occur. Then it's gonna it's gonna produce either a zero or one for f, and that could cause problems. So so we really need to be sh very confident that that will never happen, and and that that comes from the customer. The customer says no 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 we're never gonna have a uh, a and b zero and c one. That's never gonna happen. It just can't. Okay great fine. Then we'll take this as a don't care and we'll use it. Uh, we'll set it to be whatever we choose. We'll maybe call it a one, maybe call it a zero, depending on which gives us the best solution. The least, the least amount of hardware to implement your design. So it'll make it cheaper. All right, let's touch briefly on, uh, on this, uh, this uh, iterative design, design by iteration. We're gonna design an adder. Now, let's say we wanna design, we wanna add four bits of A, A, A3, A2, A1, and A0. We wanna add four bits of B, uh, B1, or, sorry, B3, B2, B1, and B0. And we want to get three bits of uh, four bits of sum. This is ridiculous. Uh, after all these years, I can't believe I've got this mistake in here. This is crazy. Let me fix this. This is crazy, crazy. And these should all be the other way anyway. So I'm, I don't know anyway. But this should definitely be. Uh, uh, it really should be. It really should be one. This should be a zero. This should be two. And this should be three. I'm not going to change the A's and B's, but they should be in this order too. All right. So now, oops. Okay. So I fixed the sums. They really should be zero, one, two, three. Oh, uh, how did I do that? Unbelievable. All right, zero, one, two, three. And then uh, I should fix the A's and B's. Someday I will, but uh, anyway. They should be in order. And uh, because this is the hierarchical bit, and that's, uh, that's, that's the higher order bit, that's the lower order bit. Um, and the carry in is added to uh, is added to a zero and b zero, not a three and a three and b three. Anyway, so these should all be switched. But whatever. But um, so 
we're going to take four bits of A, four bits of B, add them together, We're going to, and, and one bit of carry in, add that in too. And then we're going to get four bits of sum and either a carry out of zero or a carry out of one. All right. Now, how many input variables do we have and how many output variables? Well, let's see. So is C an input? Is carry in an input? Yes, it is. What about sum? No, those are outputs. What about carry out? No, it's an output too. So we have one, two, three, four, five outputs. That means we're going to have five columns for our functions, uh, for our dependent variables. And then we're going to have carry in plus four bits of A and four bits of B. So that's four plus four plus one. That's nine input variables. So how many rows will our truth table have to have with nine independent variables? Two to the ninth, that's correct. And that would be 512 rows. So that's a lot of rows, and and uh, and that's that's going to be that's going to be problematic, okay? So that's going to be a big truth table. It's going to take us a long time to do this. Maybe there's a simpler way. What if we designed a one-bit adder with one bit of a, one bit of b, one bit of carry in, and it generates one bit of sum and a carry out, and then we'll take the carry out and make it the carry in for the next one-bit adder. And we'll take the next bits of A and B, and we'll take the, and it'll generate the next sum and the next carry out and so forth. And we'll just daisy chain them all together, and uh, and we will daisy chain them together, and voila, we'll have our four bit adder. And we only have to design this one thing. We don't have to design. Uh, we don't have to do a 512 row truth table. So um, so that's what we call design by iteration. And um, so let's do that, because that's going to be a lot easier. Now we just have three inputs, A, B, and carry in. And we have two, two functions, carry out and sum. And so if they're all zero, we get this. And if they're all one, and in fact, this is really straightforward, because what we're really doing here, um, if we expand this, what we're really doing is we are, uh, we're just doing the math, right? So. So what we're really saying here is uh, if we have, let's say, we, we have a row where we have uh, A, B, and C, and here's our output sum and carry out. This is carry in. Uh, so if it's, if it's 0, 1, 1, so 1 plus 1 is, is, is uh, 2, which is a 0 and carries a 1. So we put a zero for the sum and a one for the carry out. Or if we have uh, one, one, zero, it's gonna be the same thing. What if we have all uh, one, one, ones? Well, then we'll have a one for sum and a one for a carry out. What if we have just uh, zero, one, zero? B is a one, but everything else is the same. Then then we would just, then uh, under this, we would, um, so, uh, so we just have one, so our sum would be one, and our carryout would be zero, just like that. All right, so so you can see that there's there's lots of different ways of of uh, but but all we have to do to calculate this truth table is to is to just do the math, and okay, so I'm going to switch this back. Um, maybe I'll just sh shrink it down for now. Okay, so anyway, uh, so we fill this in. And we just do the math to calculate all the values. Here, where we have one bit of A is a one, B is a one, and carry in is a one, we get a sum of one and a carry out of one. All right. Now, um, we, we, we're going to write all the min terms. So we need this min term, A prime, B prime, C, A, A prime, B, C prime, plus A, B prime, C prime, plus A, B, C. We write those down. And that's going to give us the sum. And then for the carry out, we need A prime B C, A B prime C prime, or sorry, A B, A B prime C, A B C prime, and A B C. We have a one. So we write we write we write three terms for the carry out, three uh, four terms for the sum. So sorry, four terms of the carry out, four terms of the sum. Here's the sum, there's the carry out, and then we can simplify them. The sum, the sum uh, 
looks like Hey, Marilyn. Am I catching you at a bad time? Nope. Good. Are you coming to the board meeting? Okay. Sorry, I got a phone call there, which was a little uh, um, interrupted things a bit. Okay. So anyway, so now you can see this is uh, so this is the math for the one bit uh, one bit of a one bit of b one bit of carry in generating one bit of sum and one bit of carry out and it turns out this these equations are some of the most uh, poured over and thought about equations in in all of computerdom and that's because that's because uh, let me let me switch out this I will switch it back out and And that is because all math is addition. All math is addition when it comes to what the computer does. Uh, multiplication is addition. Subtraction is addition. Division is addition. All math is addition. So uh, because of that, um, this uh, these equations are incredibly important because they really they 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 really define. Uh, the mathematical ability of computers, and um, and and they're they're they don't they don't simplify a whole lot. The first one simplifies, uh, interestingly, to um, we use this we use this exclusive or, it simplifies to a exclusive or with b exclusive or with c, and the the last one uh, reduces to b c plus a c plus a b. And these are super, super important. So, um, and it would be good for you to, to look this over. Okay, um, let's see. Uh, let me just say one, one other thing about mathematics. So, so if you add th three bits, it will always fit into two bits. Uh, because one plus one plus one is one one in binary. Um, if you add four bits to four bits plus a carry in, it'll always fit into five bits. Four bits of sum and a carry out. The carry out for unsigned addition tells us if you overflowed. So if you if you add uh, two four bit numbers and you want to store the results in a four bit location, then uh, if you have a carry out, it won't fit. So that's called an overflow. But what about when we do two's complement math? Ah, it's, it's really different. So when you do unsigned math, then you treat you treat your values, your four bit or eight bit or sixteen bit or thirty two bit values, as unsigned integers. But when you do signed math, you treat them as two's complement, which would be signed integers. In the two's complement world, it's a little different. We can do math and two's complement all day and all night and have lots of overflows and we ignore the overflows into the carry bit. Doesn't mean anything. Minus one, minus one and minus one gener added together generate an overflow. But the way we the way we do the way we do two's complement math is we, we have to we have to assess uh, overflow in a totally different way and the way we have to assess it is we we have to look at our two add ends and decide if they have the same sign or if they have different signs if they have different signs we cannot overflow but if they have the same sign then we have to inspect the sign of the sum if the sign of the sum is the same as the as the two signs of as a let's say we're adding two positives then we must get a positive sum if we're adding two negatives we must get a negative sum but if we add two positives and we get a negative sum or if we add two negatives and get a positive sum we have overflowed and that's how we assess overflow in two's complement 
If we add a positive and a negative, or a negative and a positive, we know we can never overflow, so we don't worry about it. But if we add two positives, we must check to make sure our answer is positive. If we add two negatives, we must check to make sure the answer is negative. Now, fortunately, uh, most computers, uh, most processors, uh, do this test automatically for you and give you a, a bit called the V-bit that is 1 if you overflowed uh, and 0 if you didn't. Uh, so, so that's nice, but some processors don't. And so we can actually do a little calculation in this test for overflow. And here's the calculation for the V-bit. Uh, for, for a 4-bit sum where you have A3210 A and B3210 and uh, sum 3210, we take the three high bit, high order bits and we do A prime, B prime, S, and A, B, S prime. So what we're saying is if we add two negatives, or well, if we add two positives where A3 and B3 would be zero, then S3 uh, can't, uh, can't be a one. And if it is, then the V will be one indicating an overflow. Or if, if we add uh, two, uh, two negatives, then the V bit uh, can't be a zero. I mean, the, the, sum, the higher order sum bit can't be a zero. If it is, then the V bit will be one. And that will indicate an overflow. So this is how we calculate the V bit. A, A3 prime, B3 prime, S3 plus A3, B3, S3 prime. And that, that test for adding two negatives and getting uh, a positive or adding two positives and getting a negative. Okay, and here are the here is the, the circuit in gates. One exclusive OR gate are uh, three input AND gates and an output OR gate. And if we link the modules together, then uh, this is how we can build our 4-bit uh, adder from our 1-bits using the process of design by iteration. Notice when we want to subtract, this, this is why we use 2's complement, because when we subtract, it's super easy with 2's complement. All we have to do, let's say we want to subtract B from A, and they're, they're both signed 2's complement 4-bit numbers. All we have to do is invert our B's, so we just put an inverter in the path, and we put a 1 into the carry-in, which is equivalent to inverting B and adding 1, which makes B the 2's complement negative. And then we add it to A, and that is the same as subtracting B from A. But you have to remember, our our numbers must fit into four bits. So in in this particular case, in four bits, what is the biggest, uh, what is the smallest negative number we can fit? Well, minus eight. What is the biggest positive number we can fit into four bits? S plus seven. So our number can't be any smaller than minus eight, can't be any bigger than plus seven, if we're only going to use four bits. But obviously, you know, in the normal process of things, we would use however many bits we need to get the job done. Uh, but now another problem occurs. The way these are hooked together, the result of this adder must finish completely and the carry out must be good and presented to the carry in so this can finish and generate a good carry out or you know either zero or one, it might be zero, so that then this one can finish and then so this, this one can finish. So the result is how, whatever, let's say our propagation delay time is 10 nanoseconds for each add function. The worst case is you're going to burn 10 nanoseconds here, but you can't start here until you finish here, so you're going to burn another 10, another 10, and another 10. So you're going to burn 10, 20, 30, 40 nanoseconds. So uh, when you start getting lots of bits, 64 bits and stuff like that, you have some really major, major delays. And since that, those are pretty unacceptable, that's why we've invented all sorts of other types of adders. Uh, that's where we have carry propagate, carry look ahead, and there's others. Uh, so anyway, so these are, uh, these are, this is, uh, this is how we make a subtractor though. Okay, 
So you learned, you understood how errors can arise in English sentences. Uh, you hopefully understood uh, how to translate a two table and, and write either an SOP or a POS solution for it using the min or max terms and then simplifying them if, as best you can with switching algebra. But soon we'll show you how to use a truth table, a, a, a K-map and get the optimum solution right off the bat. And then we'll, we talked about how to do a design by iteration and then uh, how we can use uh, a four bit adder uh, as a four bit subtractor by simply inverting uh, one of the inputs, whichever one we want to subtract and adding one to the carry in instead of the normal zero for the first stage. Okay, let's do a couple of problems. We still got, uh, we can steal a few more minutes here. So I'm gonna, so I'm gonna pop that out. I'm gonna switch the cameras and we'll expand it. And good. All right. So first, let's do this first one. I, I went ahead and took the liberty of, uh, of doing. Um, so let me pop this over here. Um, so here's, uh, I did, went ahead and did uh, 3.25. So simplify each of the following. So I did the first two. The first one is xy plus x prime yz prime plus yz. All right, so let's look at that one. So I, I went in and worked this one out ahead of time. Um, but I probably should do it again. But here we are. So we have xy plus x prime yz z prime plus yz. So as you inspect this, you can't, you can't combine any terms or drop any terms. But what you can do, you do have a y in every term. So the first thing we do is we just factor out the y. You can do that when it's in SOP form. You can't do that in POS form, of course. Factor out the y, and now we have x plus x prime z prime plus z. Now, it turns out that uh, using um, x plus x prime z, we can, eliminate, uh, we can eliminate the x prime. It would also be legal to eliminate the z prime. So in any, in any event, uh, and leave the x prime. So what we wind up then is with uh, 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 x plus z prime plus z. And again, we also could write this x plus x prime plus z. Either one of those would be legal. Well, um, so, but in this case, uh, these combine to one and uh, so, so then that's x plus 1. That just combines to 1 because anything ORD, so we use, uh, we use uh, z prime ORD with z is just 1, and then x ORD with 1 is 1, so that just leaves y. So this simplifies to y. Okay? Well, let's do this one. Uh, this is a POS form. Well, sort of. So notice we have... It's not in pure form. Uh, we have a single variable here, but this is good. But this, we have an and term here. So we can go ahead and we'll split this up. At least that's one, one approach. Uh, so we'll do x plus z quantity times y prime plus z. So we'll, we'll use the second distributive law and break that up into this. And then we'll go ahead and keep this x plus y prime and then z prime. Now. Uh, the first thing we can do back here using this expression, the dual of it, which is, uh, which is, is x plus z uh, times z, um, just the, uh, the, that you drop this term. Well, here we have a z prime. Oh, uh, sorry, I uh, did the wrong thing. Where we have uh, x plus z prime, or well, z and a z prime, we can drop the z. Okay, so. So we drop this term and we drop this term. And now we have x y prime uh, times x plus y prime times z prime. Now, uh, so what about, what about this? Um, well, we can now uh, distribute this in here using the first distributive law. And we would get x, x, 
y prime plus x y prime y prime all that times z. Well, this just results to x y prime plus x y prime because these are redundant. You don't need both. And x y prime plus x y prime just equals x y prime times z and that's really our final answer. So this simplifies to x y prime z. Now we could do that another way too. Uh, but uh, mm, maybe I won't uh, yeah I think that's I did write it down a little bit. Uh, we'll, we'll just let it go at that there, there are several different ways to approach this but anyway alright so hopefully that gives you uh, gives you insight on those two problems okay so uh, so with that Send text. Send text. Send text. Okay. Um, sorry, I'm getting all sorts of phone calls. So let me just finish up here. Okay. All right. So hopefully that helps you. We'll we'll finish up with that and. Um, then uh, let's see anything to say yeah so I will have office hours on Monday at noon uh, be sure and do your homework and turn it in tonight at midnight that that would be Friday at midnight it's actually it's, it's actually Thursday but uh, and I'll go ahead and post this video so you can watch it early if you want and and don't forget to do the short quiz and if you have uh, issues uh, with anything you can come to uh, office hours uh, on Monday and then I'll probably have a help session again on Wednesday uh, at least that's my plan. Uh, so we'll, we'll talk to you later.